Thank you very much, Dominic, and thank you all very much for coming today. Um, you're quite a mixed audience, um, because we have some very eminent scholars um, amongst us who have pondered and written on um, some of the issues I shall be discussing today. And then there's quite a lot of you who have not pondered <laughs> these <laughs> subjects. And uh, you've been extraordinarily supportive, many of you, in, in, in helping me with the, the writing of this book. Um, I hope that my ramblings will not be too incomprehensible to the latter group and that the former group will not be too bored by the familiarity of some of the territory I'll be, I'll be covering. There will be a bit more pepper and spice for them later in the, the paper. So, I'm going to be talking um, about a period when Rome was extending her power and influence throughout the Mediterranean. At the beginning of this period, in about 218 BC, Rome controlled peninsular Italy, Sardinia, Corsica, part of Sicily, and some enclaves on the Dalmatian coast. She was about to embark on a war, the Second Punic War, against the Carthaginian general Hannibal, who invaded Italy. It was a war that nearly wiped Rome out, but she defeated Hannibal and survived, and a century later, her embryonic empire had expanded to include the whole of modern Italy and Sicily, southern France, Spain, and part of North Africa, as well as Greece and the western part of Turkey. The Romans called this last area, the western part of Turkey, they called it the province of Asia. Fifty or so years after that, so now by the mid-first century BC, Rome also controlled the rest of Turkey, Syria and northern France. During this period, Rome was a republic run by an oligarchy comprising firstly a small group of magistrates of whom the most senior were two annually elected consuls and secondly a senate of 300 members of the Roman elite. It was a highly militarised state. No political candidate could run for the lowest public office without having served 10 campaigns in the army and Rome was only at peace for four years in the whole of the second century. In 66 BC, the Roman orator Cicero delivered a speech, the De Imperio Trinae Pompei. In it, he argued that Pompey the Great should be given the military command against, military, uh, against Mithridates VI, the ruler of Pontus, an area on the Black Sea coast of modern Turkey, in the middle of the, the map there. Cicero reminds his Roman audience of the disasters which befell them 22 years earlier, in 88 BC, when the same Mithridates invaded the Roman province of Asia over there on the, the west coast. In one passage, Cicero says that the invasion caused the loss of so much Roman money that credit was destroyed at Rome itself. For then, when very many people lost large fortunes in Asia, we know that there was a collapse of credit at Rome because repayments were interrupted. It is indeed impossible for many individuals in a single state to lose their property and fortunes without involving still greater numbers in their ruin. Defend the Republic from this danger, and believe me when I tell you what you see for yourselves, that this credit and this system of monies the Latin word is pecuniae, which operates at Rome in the Forum, is bound up in and is linked with those Asian monies, the Latin term is pecuniae asiaticae. The loss of the one inevitably undermines the other and causes its collapse. Now this passage is remarkable in its contemporary tone. If you substitute the words <laughs> U.S. subprime for the Asian monies, the pecuniae asiaticae, and the words UK banking system for the system of monies which operates in the Roman Forum, 
And it could have been written about the 2008 credit crisis. What is so striking about Cicero's text is that it clearly talks about financial markets that are linked around the Roman world. The financial capital represented by the pecuniae asiaticae, the Asian monies, is linked explicitly to the forum in Rome. <coughs> if we rewind a century and a quarter to Rome's war against Hannibal, it is clear that Rome had also been in severe financial trouble then. The Roman historian Livy says that in 214 BC, in the middle of that war, the Roman treasury was virtually bankrupt, a fact confirmed by the contemporaneous debasement of Rome's silver coinage and a dramatic fall in the weight of its bronze coinage. So the interesting question becomes, how did the Romans move from a position in 214 BC, when their economy was on its knees, to one in 88 BC, when their economic interests were so significant in Asia that the invasion of that province by Mithridates caused a credit crisis at Rome of which Cicero speaks? Now, the economic history of the late Republic has enjoyed a renewed attention in the past 20 odd years, but this revival has mainly focused on demographic and agricultural questions, two perspectives that have dominated the debate since Monson and Belloc were writing in the 19th century. My argument is that in 2nd century BC Rome, increased inflows of bullion combined with an expansion in the availability of credit to produce a massive increase in Rome's money supply. Or to put it another way, in 2nd century BC Rome, there was a boom in monetary liquidity. This increase in the supply and availability of money in turn resulted in a major increase in Roman economic activity because it stimulated market developments in areas such as agriculture, trade, construction and manufacturing. It also resulted eventually in the credit crisis of 88 BC. Monetarist explanations of economic behaviour in the ancient world are rare, in large part because of the enormous influence of Moses Finlay, who was Professor of Ancient History at Cambridge in the 1970s, who believed in the primitive nature of the ancient economy. However, such explanations are not uncommon in analyses of the Middle Ages and uh, the early modern period. So the arrival of vast amounts of gold and silver bullion from the New World is the standard explanation for 16th century Europe's rapid steps towards the more specialist urban market economy. From 1500 to 1640, the population of England, for example, more than doubled, and the population living in substantial towns quintupled, driven by the flow of people from the countryside to the growing economic prospects of urban centres. In addition, the growth of trade networks led to major changes in the specialisation and commercialisation of agriculture a development that we shall find echoed later in this paper. I'm going to begin by looking at the inflows of bullion into Rome during this period. And I've put on this slide and also on the handout some monetary equivalences, as well as some idea of purchasing power. During the 3rd century BC, Rome had seized booty and in some cases war indemnities from defeated Italian tribes, from Pyrrhus of Epirus, from Hero of Syracuse, from the Carthaginians and from the Illyrians. The scale of the booty is unquantifiable, but it looks as though we would not be far wrong to assume that war indemnities paid to Rome by defeated enemies totaled some 5,000 talents before the war against Hannibal at the, end of the, at the end of the third century. That the Roman state's resources um, were not enormous, however, um, is shown not only by the fact 
by the lack of funds in the Treasury in 214, but more generally by the fact that during the third century, Rome minted very limited amounts of silver coinage. During the second century BC, however, as her control and influence expanded through the Mediterranean, vast quantities of bullion came to Rome in the form of war booty and indemnities from most of her defeated enemies, notably Carthage, Macedonia and Syria. We know that the war indemnities alone received between 200 and 150 BC totaled over 27,000 talents. Add the value of captured booty, which probably amounts to more than 18,000 talents, and Rome received, over a 50-year period, nearly 46,000 talents of gold and silver from warfare alone, more than seven times the amount that she had received in the whole of the 3rd century. As the contemporary Greek historian Polybius said, who has perhaps a certain logic in appropriating all the gold and silver for themselves, for it was impossible for them to aim at world domination unless they deprived other peoples of such resources and acquired them for themselves. One result of all this was that in 167 BC, the Roman state suspended the collection of tribute from its own citizens. In effect, this was a massive tax cut. After that date, no tax was levied on the wealth or income of Roman citizens for nearly 500 years. At the same time, Polybius suggests that by the mid-2nd century, significant quantities of bullion, approximately 35 tonnes of silver per annum, were being minted in Spain, a territory which had been captured from the Carthaginians during the war against Hannibal. Independent corroboration of Polybius' report is now provided from an unusual source. From the 1970s onwards, the study of the problem of acid rain drew attention to the existence of a strong south-to-north atmospheric transport that carries not only acid emissions northwards from industrial centres in continental Europe and Britain, but also lead and other pollutants. In the early 1990s, analysis of the ice sheet of central Greenland confirmed that the concentration of lead fallout from the atmosphere rose rapidly from the 2nd century BC onwards, reaching a clearly detectable peak at the end of the 1st century BC. Isotopic analysis of this lead found in these ice cores suggested that as much as 70% of the man-made lead pollution may be related to silver smelting operations in southern Spain. This evidence shows that at the time of which Polybius was writing, smelting activities from silver and lead mining in Spain were creating high and rising levels of atmospheric pollution over Greenland and Northern Europe. During the 2nd century BC, therefore, the Romans received money and bullion on a scale which dwarfed anything which they had received previously. From booty and indemnities alone, it was the equivalent of 22 tonnes of silver per annum. The Spanish mines were generating 35 tonnes of silver each year. We also know that by the early 1st century, taxation from the territories which Rome captured during the 2nd century, of which the province of Asia was the most important, was producing the equivalent of perhaps 190 tonnes of silver per annum. These vast inflows of bullion effectively turbocharged the Roman monetary economy, and the coinage element of Rome's money supply expanded rapidly. No mint records survive, but it has been estimated by Pro Professor Michael Crawford, who's here tonight, that the <coughs> supply of Roman silver coins increased by perhaps as much as 10 times between 157 BC and 50 BC. Now, undoubtedly, some of this coin went into monetizing parts of the Roman economy which still operated on the basis of barter. But the monetary impact of growth on this scale would normally be either to 
increase the level of economic activity or to cause prices to rise. However, there is nothing to suggest anything other than um, a fairly limited um, price inflation for important commodities such as wheat, although there is evidence for more extreme price movements of luxury goods such as specialist slaves and nothing changes private houses at Rome itself. The general lack of inflationary pressure is all the more remarkable given that there is also considerable evidence that credit extended by early Roman bankers provided a mechanism for the creation of money beyond the available supply of precious metals, thereby serving to expand to Rome's total money supply yet further. As we now know, any economy which has deposit banks or similar institutions, um, in that economy, the money supply is not limited to the volume of coinage or cash issued by central authorities. The reason for this is that there is a money multiplier effect by means of which bank deposits and loans create the substance with which it is possible to buy things without diminishing anyone's assets. But until very recently, most ancient historians tended to follow Moses Finley, who believed that the money supply in the ancient world was essentially inelastic, because of its reliance on coin and what he termed the lack of machinery for credit beyond the lending of coin. On this view, all Roman money, pecunia, consisted of official Roman coinage only. In the last few years, however, a number of scholars have begun to challenge this view, arguing that the term pecunia included both coin and credit. <coughs> now, bankers function largely in a world of hidden transactions and of confidential dealings, and so our knowledge would be limited, even without the problem of the general scarcity of ancient source material. But we do, in fact, have sufficient literary material to show that institutions similar to modern deposit banks existed in Rome during the second century. According to the historian Livy, bankers, the Latin term for which is Argentari, first appeared in Rome in about 310 BC. By the second century, we begin to find evidence that their activities had become <coughs> sufficiently widespread to crop up without comment in contemporary literary works. For example, about 40 passages from the comic playwrights Plautus and Terence, who were writing in the 2nd century BC, refer to banking matters in such a way as to suggest that these activities are considered both by the playwright and by the audience to be commonplace. From what these playwrights say, it is clear that bankers conducted their business in the forum. One could go to them to arrange payments because money was deposited with them, as this quotation shows. If you entrust the bankers with anything, they're out of the forum faster than a hare from its cage door at the games. Similarly, the historian Polybius relates an episode in the late 160s BC in which a senator, Scipio Emilianus, has 50 talents, a very large amount of money indeed, on deposit with a banker. A number of passages from Plautus suggest that bankers fulfil both a credit and a deposit function. For example, if we look at this passage from one of Plautus's plays called the Corculio, a character called Lyco, who is himself a banker, says at one point, I seem to be blessed. I've drawn up a little account to work out how, mon how much money I have and how much I've borrowed. I'm rich as long as I don't repay those who I owe. If I do repay my creditors, there's more around to borrow. Between the Roman bank and the modern bank, there are, of course, huge striking differences in technology, in their legal and regulatory positions, and in the scope of their operations. The businesses of the Roman Argentarii, as far as we can tell, were unincorporated and were operated largely by individual proprietors, almost entirely free of government regulations. There was no state bank and no central bank. 
Yet the ancient evidence and modern banking codes fits on the same basic factors in finding the necessary essence of a bank in its generation of revenue through loans funded by outside deposits, those whom I owe, as Lyco says, which the bank must return. Now, the existence of a credit market in 2nd century BC Rome has important implications. In any economy, good financial markets and appropriate financial institutions help people who have ideas for production or for trade to obtain resources to implement those ideas. Deposit banks are therefore normally part of a healthy market ecology. Now that statement may seem strange to some, given the critical opprobrium heaped on banks and bankers in recent years. But without these markets and institutions, or if they are impaired, the prospects for economic growth and progress are far more limited, as the last five years have shown us. The existence of credit credit creation mechanisms in the second century would have served to expand Rome's money supply and therefore to encourage an increase in effective demand. And in other words, a growth in bank lending would have led to an expansion in the volume of commercial transactions and activity. And indeed, we find a number of indications of this economic expansion, for which money was the principal driver. The major catalyst appears to have been Rome's defeat of the Syrian king Antiochus III, and the huge war indemnity and the booty which the Roman commander Manlius Fulso brought back from Asia in 187. This tradition was still strong when Pliny the Elder was writing a couple of centuries later. According to him, the Roman people began to spray their cash around in the consulship of Spurius Posthumus and Quintus Marcius, which was in 186 BC, so great was the abundance of money. More generally, the Roman state's capital expenditure patterns during the 20 years that followed, in particular the intensity of building activity, appeared to correlate closely with what we know about the inflows of revenue into the Roman treasury and to the Roman state's financial position. Basilicas, as well as harbour and retail facilities, were built in Rome, and the sewerage system was upgraded. Two new aqueducts, the Aqua Marcia, the remains of which are shown here, and the Aqua Tepula, more than doubled Rome's water supply. Their construction suggests growing urbanisation, as increased supplies of water imply demand from larger numbers of city dwellers. The cost of the Aqua Marcia alone, which was built in the 140s BC and was 94 kilometres long, was 7,500 talents, making it the single most expensive building project undertaken during the Republic. Construction projects such as these would have increased demand for labour and produced a Keynesian multiplier effect making urban wages attractive relative to rural incomes. In addition, new expensive roads were constructed in Italy and in Macedonia, Spain and the province of Asia later in the century. The creation of a road network by the military for the military had the economically beneficial side effect of allowing commercial traffic to move more efficiently. In fact, Roman roads represented a development that was unparalleled in the world, with the exception of China, down to the development of the English canal system in the 18th century and the arrival of the railways in the 19th. They were of a uniformly high technical quality, capable of carrying wheeled vehicles with heavy loads. They promoted economic connectivity and integration, because they helped the movement not only of goods and products, but also of people, money, information, technology and ideas. In turn, they encouraged urbanisation by making money and markets more accessible. They would have overcome many of the transport constraints 
that affected most other ancient, medieval, and early modern societies. Another important engine of growth was trade, as it has been for many other countries at different stages of development. For example, since 1950, there has been a colossal liberalisation of world trade under the auspices of GATT and then the, now the WTO, which has led to a massive expansion in the growth of world trade and acted as an important driver of world economic output. Since the 1950s, the volume of world trade has grown 16 times at an average compound rate of just over 7% per annum, and world GDP has expanded fourfold. For the ancient world, though, shipwrecks can supply proxy information for levels of trade. With the increase in popularity of scuba diving in the last 60 years or so, there's been a sharp increase in the number of ancient wrecks discovered in the Mediterranean. And a number of these have subsequently been investigated by archaeologists. This graph displays the number of ancient shipwrecks from each 50-year period between 1500 BC and 1500 AD, and it reveals a steep increase in the number of wrecks in the second half of the second century BC, and therefore presumably in the volume of shipping and of cargoes carried. An overwhelming majority of the shipwrecks found in the western Mediterranean and dating to the last two centuries BC carried cargoes which mainly consisted of wine and olive oil amphorae from central Italy and mainly destined for Spain and France. We can date, we can date the takeoff in this trade in wine and olive oil fairly precisely. This is because there was a shift in the shape of amphora used to transport the wine from one called Greco-Italic on the left to a type called Dressel 1A on the right. And this shift, it now seems, took place between about 150 and 130 BC. Now the previous graph suggested that the volume of trade increased by something over 250% because there are about two and a half times as many cargoes of Dressel 1A amphorae in Rex, dating from the century after 150 BC, as cargoes of Greco-Italic amphorae in the preceding century. But one thing in the previous graph does not <coughs> take into sorry, one thing the previous graph does not take into account is the size of ships. After the invention of the bilge pump probably in the last decades of the 2nd century BC, it was possible to build larger ships. Before the late 2nd century, ships carried a maximum of about 75 tonnes of cargo, equivalent to about 1,500 wine amphorae. The Albenga wreck, for example, which sank in around 90 BC off the Italian coast to the west of Genoa, and which is estimated to have been about 500 tonnes, probably carried 10,000 wine amphorae. Since each amphora contained about 26 litres, the cargo of this vessel must have totaled some 260,000 litres of wine, equivalent to about 350,000 modern wine bottles. So these volumes suggest a very high degree of agricultural specialisation in central Italy, where the cargo originated. And I would add that it is possible that it was not just wine and olive oil that was being exported from Italy, but other commodities as well. One of the main reasons why ancient wrecks are discovered is because of mounds formed on the seabed by the ceramic amphorae which form their cargoes. The wicker baskets and sacks that carried other soft commodities would have perished on a wreck, along with their contents, and can no longer be traced.
If we look at other periods of history, we can see a direct link between expanding supplies of money and economic activity. I've already mentioned the impact of New World bullion in, on the economy of 16th century Europe. Another, another example of this would be the commercial revolution of the 13th century AD. Peter Spufford, a monetary historian of medieval Europe, attributes the economic boom which occurred then to the link between silver mining and the development of trade and industry. In the 13th century, Central European silver moved from newly developed mining areas such as Bohemia, Harz and Meissen, through Flanders and the Champagne fairs to Italy, and then on to the eastern Mediterranean and even as far as China. In the other direction came luxury goods, items such as clothing and furnishings from Flanders and Tuscany, pepper and spices from Asia, silks from Constantinople and China. The increase in demand for luxury goods, backed up by the ready availability of large amounts of silver coin, brought about an enormous quantitative change in the volume of international trade. And a similar development in trade with the East seems to have occurred in the late 2nd century BC with the emergence of the Aegean island of Delos as a centre of a trans-Mediterranean trade in slaves and luxury goods. The geographer and historian Strabo says that Delos was capable of handling 10,000 slaves per day. Pliny the Elder reports that the island became a production centre for the perfume trade, a point reinforced by archaeological evidence for the existence of perfume factories there. The international scale of the trade, based on Delos, is demonstrated by the evidence of inscriptions from the island, which show that most of the merchants residing there originated either from Italy or from the eastern Mediterranean, with some of them coming from as far away as the Persian Gulf and South Yemen. In his explanation of why Delos became the preferred location for the slave and perfume trade, Strabo identifies the ready availability of finance on the island as being one of the main factors. And his comment is supported by the evidence of inscriptions which mention bankers, both from Italy and from the Eastern Mediterranean. The earliest known banker from mainland Italy is Marcus Minatius, who donated a large amount of money to a Delian association of merchants from Beirut in about 150 BC. After him came two bankers called Gerilani, two named Alfidii, and at least three Fulvii, all of these being Italian names. Finally, towards the end of the second century, a group of bankers dedicated a monument bearing this inscription, the Bankers on Delos. I briefly mentioned slaves on Delos just now, and I just want to add a further comment on the economic impact of slavery. Demographic developments in Italy during this period remain unclear and fiercely disputed. But there is little doubt that the import into Italy of perhaps somewhere between 2 million and 4 million slaves over the last two centuries BC, sourced through warfare and trade, gradually changed the demographic composition of peninsular Italy. From an economic perspective, this inflow of slaves, who presumably were living at or close to subsistence, meant that labour input per head of population in mainland Italy would have grown, resulting in increased productivity. This was for the simple reason that enslavement forced victims to work harder at below the market rate for wage labour. So far, I have been looking at possible causes of growth, such as capital inflows 
and the development of the banking industry. And symptoms of growth, such as commercial expansion and construction. And it is reasonably clear, I hope, that there was a major increase in the growth potential or the supply side of the Roman Republican economy during the second century. But the problem is to quantify that growth. We don't know the size of the Roman economy for any moment in its history. And the scarcity of numerical evidence in our ancient sources is a major issue. Modern economic analysis, of course, makes extensive use of data mainly produced by governments, industry associations and corporations, which are collected and subjected to statistical analysis. In ancient Rome, there are piecemeal survivals of some figures scattered amongst the works of narrative historians and antiquarians, mainly occasional cash items such as the, amount of, the amounts of bullion in the Roman state treasury and of war indemnities and booty from defeated enemies. There are occasional references to amounts of expenditure, but even for such financial data as does exist, there is sometimes a tendency for ancient authors to stylize monetary valuations into conventional figures, the 10,000 slaves a day on DLOS that I just mentioned. So this last part of my paper is highly conjectural. Much is uncertain, and nearly everything is disputed, and in a brief account, I shall inevitably simplify complex issues. But my solution to this problem was to model a probabilistic quantification of the Roman economy between 150 and 50 BC. My aim being to produce a matrix of variables which collectively and through comparison could give some indication of whether real per capita economic growth did occur. Economic growth is the increase in the output of an economy over time. It is a process of change over time, and its significance lies in its contribution to the prosperity of a community. In the official terminology of modern national accounts, growth is usually measured in terms of an increase over time in real, that is inflation adjusted, per capita gross domestic product, or GDP. Now, although macroeconomic quantification was in fact first attempted in the 17th century, it fell out of fashion until the 1950s, but it became a major tool for macroeconomic policy analysis. The first set of standardized accounts for 16 European countries was not published until 1954, and even in the first decade of the 21st century, implementation of the system of standardized national accounts in the former communist Eastern Bloc was not complete. So it's scarcely surprising, therefore, that the history of macroeconomic estimates for ancient Rome has a short academic pedigree. But in brief, my, pro my approach has been to attempt to measure the size of the Roman economy at three different dates. 150, 100, and 50 BC. This was so that by comparing the estimated size of the economy at each of these dates, I could see whether real per capita economic growth is likely to have occurred. My starting point was to produce estimates of GDP for each of these dates from the income side. An example of this, the result for 150 BC, is on the screen and on your handouts. From the sporadic notices of individual elite wealth in our sources, I extrapolated income pyramids from the data using Vilfredo Pareto's finding that the distribution of income tends to fall into a predictable pattern governed by power laws. This procedure produced some historically credible results into which could be fitted quite reasonably both the general trends in living standards which we can derive from ancient accounts, and the very small number of reports of non-elite individual income that can be gleaned from ancient texts. For example, the annual pay for an ordinary soldier in the mid-2nd century 
appears to have been 480 sesterces, which is equivalent on my calculations to the average income for a non-elite household in 150 BC, or about 60% above the level of subsistence. In fact, in terms of sustainability, the average inhabitant of Italy in 150 BC, if there was such a thing, would, on my estimates, have had a standard of living equivalent to a peasant with a few goats. Next, I attempted to quantify GDP from the expenditure side by examining state and private investment and state and private consumption as well as the balance of trade. A large part of this last exercise involved a high degree of guesswork, but again, it was possible to construct a probabilistic quantification that fitted with my estimates of income GDP. And finally, as a check on my numbers for income GDP, I went on to construct a further series of estimates <coughs> of nominal GDP by combining what we know or can infer about the Roman money supply with hypothetical numbers for the velocity of circulation of money and levels of monetization. Now, this may just be regarded as juggling with numbers, and of course, to an extent, it is. These three different approaches, based on estimates of income, expenditure, and monetary variables, are unlikely to be even remotely accurate taken individually. But together, they may give some degree of probabilistic plausibility. In effect, what I was doing was adapting the technique that the late Keith Hopkins, professor of ancient history at Cambridge in the 1980s and 90s, called the wigwam argument. The wigwam argument consists of several pieces of evidence, each insufficient or untrustworthy in itself, which seem collectively to confirm a proposition. As Hopkins put it, each pole would fall down by itself, but together the poles stand up by leaning on each other. They point roughly in the same direction. Now, my wigwam approach, which to repeat is highly conjectural, suggests that real per capita GDP in mainland Italy grew by 72% between 150 and 50 BC. An average compound annual growth rate of 0.54%. Now, that sounds like a, a small number compared to the growth rate of modern economies, but for a pre-industrial agrarian economy, it's not. Angus Madison, the high priest of historical macroeconomic quantification, estimates that between 1500 and 1800, the Netherlands achieved per capita GDP growth of 0.28% per annum, and the UK of the same period a growth rate of 0.27% per annum. My estimate for late Republican Rome is double those rates. But there are a couple of more granular conclusions which can be stated with perhaps a higher degree of confidence. The first is that the wealth of the Italian elite and their incomes grew significantly, perhaps as much as fivefold between 150 and 50 BC, and that the per capita income of the free non-elite population also grew by about 80% on my estimates, suggesting that income disparities increased significantly during this period. The second conclusion concerns expenditure by the Roman state. Now, it's important to realise that the Roman state never borrowed, apart from once as a crisis measure during the Second Punic War. There was certainly no concept of the regular issuance of government debt, and there was no bond market. Unlike, say, the British government, which financed its way through the Napoleonic Wars by issuing large amounts of bonds through the Bank of England, the only way that the Roman state could continue to fight its wars was by having enough precious metal coming into the treasury with which to pay its troops. So because the Roman state did not borrow during this period, its expenditure could never have been greater than the income which it received. 
be it in money or in kind. We can, therefore, estimate with a reasonable degree of confidence the Roman state's income and equate that with Roman state expenditure. As a check, we can compare that number with the cost of the Roman army, which we can work out roughly from other sources. The only other two significant items of state expenditure were investment in urban infrastructure and roads, and after 122 BC, the Corn Bill. If we then compare the resulting numbers with total estimated GDP, what is striking is the tiny proportion accounted for by the state, less than 6% during this period. Viewed in this light, while military expenditure was a major catalyst of economic growth, it was not, perhaps surprisingly, a significant constituent of the economy in itself. So, to conclude, we can identify three major developments in the Roman economy ahead of the crisis of 88 BC. Firstly, military conquest produced an extraordinary return on investment as the accumulated surpluses of the Mediterranean and neighbouring territories were grabbed by the Romans. This resulted in a boom in monetary liquidity at Rome, driven by large inflows of silver bullion from warfare, from mining, and eventually from provincial taxation, much of which was eventually reissued as silver coin. Secondly, there is evidence from contemporary authors that Roman bankers created pecunia, or money, beyond the available supply of precious metals. As the numbers of professional bankers grew and the scale of their lending increased, there would have been an additional and possibly profound impact on the size of the Roman money supply. Thirdly, the boom in monetary liquidity resulted in a major increase in economic activity, with real per capita GDP growing on my estimates by a little over a half percent per annum. This is evidenced by construction at Rome, by a sharp increase in the number of shipwrecks, by the trade in wine and olive oil to the western Mediterranean, and by the trade in slaves and luxury goods from the eastern Mediterranean. This last development brought increased Roman com commercial involvement to the Aegean and to the province of Asia, and led to an increase in the geographic extent of the Roman financial system. During the second half of the 2nd century and the early 1st century BC, bankers expanded their activities eastwards, creating the Asian monies, the pecuniae asiaticae, the loans which Cicero describes as being at the centre of the financial meltdown of 88 BC. So the essential similarity between what happened <coughs> 21 centuries ago and what happened to the UK economy in 2008 is that a massive increase in monetary liquidity culminated in problems in another country causing a credit crisis at home. In both cases, distance and over-optimism obscured the risk. Indeed, the words of uh, Chuck Prince, the CEO of Citigroup in July 2007, a year before the crash of 2008, could just as easily have been uttered by a Roman banker of the early 1st century BC. When the music stops in terms of liquidity, things will be complicated. But as long as the music is playing, you've got to get up and dance. We're still dancing. Thank you very much.
involved in the city is, do you feel more confident in your interpretation of the Roman economy than you do of the modern economy? <laughs> Well, those that know me, know me well know I know absolutely nothing about the modern economy. <laughs> so, um, I think it's very difficult because I think it's very difficult, it's very easy to retroject one's interpretation of what's going now on now into the ancient world. And, um, and I've been consistently aware of that. But I think when you put all the pieces together and put all these elements together, then I, you know, the, there's nothing that I've come across, and there's no evidence that I've come across that has led me to think that this interpretation is wrong. I mean, I, I just, I, you know, I'd love to find some evidence that does not fit into this, 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 this picture, and that there probably is, and I, I, I'd love it if someone would, would highlight it to me. But so. My very simple view is that um, you know m m money is terribly, terribly important um, for for driving economies. It is ultimately the the most important um, element, um, and that um, you know Rome. You know, one of the reasons why there wasn't a lot of money in Rome in the, the third century BC, I think, was because you know it. They just had not developed a culture of using money and relied on barter. But when you see these amounts of bullion coming into to, um, to Rome and the con contemporaneous expansion of a banking industry, however primitive and embryonic that might be, then, then that, that tells a story. Um, I believe we have to take yeah. a, a few questions from yeah. the floor. Yeah. Um, anyone has had a question that they would like to ask? I will do that. Let me ask you, thank you very much for your talk. Um, was your first quotation where you referred to the linkage between the Rome, Rome's um, economy and the economy of, of Asia um, suggested to me quite a close relationship that wasn't purely based upon supplying Rome with money. And I wondered if there was anything more to it, for example, Embryonic bills of exchange or um, insurance of trade or any other kind of commercial relationship that, that would have made their economies closer, uh, closer down. Yeah, I mean, I, it's obviously a slightly bigger subject than what I presented here. I mean, the, 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 the other main um, activity for which there is a, a, a lot of evidence is, not a lot, but some evidence is the activities of public army, which were basically private, se private sector tax collectors operating in Asia during the period. Um, and um, these, these were um, reasonably um, sophisticated businesses, for want of a better term, um, and they undoubtedly were active um, at, at the time that um, Mithridates invaded. But in terms of um, bills of exchange and um, insurance activities, I mean, there's, uh, th there's no real evidence specific to, there's no real evidence that, there's no evidence, I should say, that bills of exchange um, existed in the, in the Roman world. And yes, there were, there were types of insurance, particularly in respect of um, um, bottomry loans for ships, which effectively are insurance contracts in another form, um, but nothing else specific to Asia. I would just say the public army and possibly this this um, this piece from Cicero shows that money was being lent there. Yes, sorry, Mr. Andrew. Uh, but, but you can't be any great doubt about the overall picture you paint, both in terms of general likelihood and also, in, as you say, the scraps of evidence we have to sort of fit together to support it. But obviously you'd be disappointed if we didn't raise one or two questions about quantification at the, at the end. Sorry, can you hear in the back? So, I mean, without going into the details, we all know when you quantify things, you don't have to change the variables enormously to produce a very different picture. Yeah. 
So suppose if we are, I was to invite you to put your hand on your heart and say mm -hmm. the limits of accuracy of what I said are what, 50%? I would, I would say, I mean, I, I embarked on this, uh, the, 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 the encouragement of my two dear examiners who happen to be here tonight, I can blame them, <laughs> Professor Alan Bowman, <laughs> who examined my D-Phil along with Professor Michael Crawford over there. Um, and I thought, oh, God, what a pain. <laughs> and I spent about a year trying to work out what to do and looked at various alternative ways of approaching all this. And I <coughs> promise you, I was... I was deeply, deeply resistant to the idea of, of any kind of probabilistic quantification on the road. Um, the more I actually did start fiddling with m numbers, and there are very, as, as you all know, Andrew, and others will, but, but for, the, for everyone here, you know, there's a very limited amount of information one has got to go on. Very few numbers, as I said during my paper. So, to actually come up with you know, a probabilistic quantification. I thought it would, I thought, you know, how are we going to narrow this down? But actually, and that's where it's interesting when you look at it, not just from the point of view of one, one set of GDP numbers. You know, if you look at it from income, from expenditure, from monetary variables, and you know even better than I do that, you know, how do you come up with a you know, convincing set of monetary variables. But ultimately, what I found was that you couldn't actually fit everything together. <laughs> um, so, uh, un unless, you know, somehow these, these um, estimates all had to work in, in sync with each other. So, you know, if you expanded the velocity of circulation of money, which greatly expands the, the size of the monetary economy, if you like, then that probably has a, a does have a, a, a rather bizarre knock-on effect to how much people were earning you know, during, down that income pyramid. So, to answer the question, I, I, and this is just off the top of my head, I'd say it has a, has a variance of 20 or 30 percent. Now, the, but, the, but the big variable to all this, and huge variable, and this is where ultimately we've got a massive problem, is what is the population of, of Italy? Because that's what I was looking at there. And for the benefit of people who haven't sort of had to trudge through this area, <laughs> there is a massive debate between um, what are known as the low counters, who believe that the population of Italy was, let's say, of the order of 5 million, and the high counters, who believe it's of the order of 10 million. And um, <coughs> There are some very, very strong arguments both ways. I, I think it's the balance of probabilities on the on the low count side. But so one is juggling with a huge number of variables, and I think that 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 is the single that you know if one knew the population, I'd be reasonably confident. I'd probably say that these estimates have a you know twenty percent degree of variability. But I think it goes out because of the um, we don't know the, the, size of, the size of the population. Richard, I, I have two, a question related to that. Uh, I, have a related to what you're asking I have a question related to that, uh, and that uh, is uh, how do you account for inflation? And the second issue that is your, your velocity of exchange. I noticed it goes up quite considerably over the, over the period. And you said if you up it any further, the economy just gets too big. But what if, happens if you reduce that figure? Okay. I mean, the, 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 well, I'll take the second one first. I mean, if you reduce it, if you reduce that figure below one, <laughs> then there's no money going anywhere. You know, it just basically goes into a hole in the ground and stays there, which clearly some of it did. Um, because velocity of circulation is purely a measure of how many times it is exchanged over a period of time in you know, a year. So, um, and I'm assuming that in my calculations that early on, um, you know, when money first began to be used more widely, it wasn't exchanged that much, but that gradually it was more exchanged as time as time went by. Um, on the um, sorry, can you just repeat your first point? I got it's about inflation. Inflation. 
Sorry, I, I deliberately skipped that all out because otherwise we'd be in here all night. But obviously, there is, a, um, you know, inflation has to be taken account of, and I do discuss this in my book. The, again, we come back to the lack of data. There is, a, there is a, as you probably know, there is a, there is a total lack of any form of data, price data series during the Roman Republic. Um, you get um, the odd bit of information from Polybius on the one hand as to some wheat prices in Spain, in northern Italy, in about 150 BC. You get some wheat prices from another speech of Cicero's, the Verines, from the 80s BC. Um, and if you take the lowest price that Polybius quotes in 150 and the highest price that Cicero quotes, that implies an inflation rate of about 2.5%. But these are just scattered data points, and I don't think you can make much out of that. Um, the, the, so the route I went to, with, with lots of ifs and buts, was to look at the... The, the numismatic history of um, small Roman coins. So basically saying if you looked at what the smallest Roman coin was in 200 BC and what it was in 100 BC, um, it's a bit like, you know, equivalent to if our 5p stopped being used and that the 10p became a bit more popular, that might give some insight into, into where the prices were. Were falling. But I don't, I don't pretend it's, 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 it's particularly accurate, but I think that it, it, it probably fits. You know, we're, we've got a relatively low, low rate of inflation over time. Okay, well, Chris. You. Philip, I think my question was about one of the poles of the wigwam. Oh. That is to say, the, the more I get excited, and I am excited about your sense of a greater and more sophisticated private economy with banking and significant rates of economic growth. My concern is, should I then be surprised or concerned about the state economy remaining surprisingly primitive? If put the other way around, how does one account or should one be surprised for this sort of significant inconsistency between the sophistication of the private sector, as you've mapped it, and the remaining really primitive, no government bond financial approach of the government sector? Yes, I mean, well, I don't know whether concern is the right word, but I think, I think it must be the case. You know, there is absolutely no indication that the, the Roman state did borrow. And therefore, its, its, its expenditure patterns must have been entirely determined by the amount of um, revenue that they had coming in in the form of you know, booty, mining revenue, or taxation. Um, there, were, there, there was no, no other alternatives. Now, um, obviously, the, the, the amount available to the Roman state expanded the more that the, their empire expanded. Um, the fact that Roman citizens were not taxed on their income <laughs> or their wealth um, was only possible because, ultimately, because they were taxing everyone else in the extending and growing empire. So I don't think that um, the picture during, and I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the, the principate or the imperial period, I'm only talking about the republic, and I think during the republic um, you're really looking at a state that um, spent money on, on the army, and that's obviously why the um, the, the, the military leaders ran around trying to find enough bullion to, to pay their soldiers with um, at various points on the corn dole, depending on whether or not the corn dole was being distributed, and on, uh, and on infrastructure projects. And those are the only major items. I can't think of anything else major that they could have spent money on. I can't think of any other sources other than the ones I just mentioned that they could have used for doing so. I don't know if that answers the question, Chris. Not really. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was very elegant in itself. Well, 
I suppose I was also thinking about, about the principle where the state also remains economically quite primitive. I yeah. suppose that what I was doing in a way was encouraging you to say that actually if your model is right, hmm. you've said something quite radical and important about the nature of the Roman state. Yes. So it might be interesting that yes. in a world super state, a Mediterranean state, that there isn't any degree of significant sophistication in the state's approach to... Well, I think, I think that's certainly true. And I suspect that, again, I'm not an expert on, on, on the, the later period, but I suspect that is true. I mean, that is... And that is a radical difference, as I said, from, you know, the way that Britain funded itself in the late 18th century. So I think it is. I think it is. And I think that's always a constraint. And I suspect that, again, I'm not an expert, but why pressures eventually built up. Um, because, you know, during the, the third, fourth, fifth centuries, because they gradually ran out of money. Okay, one last question. Do you see any connection between the um, economic revolution and the political uh, development of the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Republic at the time? The, the question was, for those that couldn't hear, was it, do I see any connection between the, the, the economic revolution and political developments at the time? And yes, I do. I mean, quite considerable developments, because I think that quite, quite considerable connections, because I think that an awful lot of, I mean, and that's not just in the development of war leaders roaring around the Mediterranean with large armies, um, you know, beating each other up in, in the far-flung parts of the Mediterranean. Um, I, I think it, it does, it must help to explain, for example, some of the agrarian issues which were coming to a head in the late <coughs> second century BC uh, surrounding the Gracchi. Um, and as, as an example, where you, know, you have disparities of wealth beginning to appear, um, and you have people who are maybe not getting access to the most productive land in central Italy, which perhaps is being grabbed by wealthier landowners who are flogging their wine to Spain and Gaul and so on. So, yes, I think, it, I mean, in, read the book. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I think we've certainly um, got our money's worth out of Philip this afternoon. Uh, he had the warm up of a two hour council meeting earlier, <laughs> uh, from which he came in here. He's giving, uh, given us uh, a brilliant, clear, and um, uh, uh, stimulating talk. And we still have the delights of his um, book to read.